Hi, everybody. I hope you can hear me. Thank you so much for joining us here in the, this extended Q&A. Um, and um, thank you, Joyce, for moderating. I hope everybody enjoyed the talk. Um, and we're just waiting for Sandra as well to join us here now. Um, can you hear me now, Luisa? Yep, I can. Wait, so sorry about that. Um, nice. Great. Welcome, everyone. Hi, Ellen. Hi, Ellen. Hi, Ellen. <laughs> Welcome to our Q&A. Do you have a question for Marisette? I do, after that wonderful presentation. I've never seen a presentation so amazing. I'm so proud of you, too. Um, how has it been going in the pandemic? Have you been able to get back to work at all? Online work, a lot of uh, fundraising on the side, just because we're not able to go out. Uh, we're not able to run our trips as well for the public. So a lot of it has been online virtual uh, classroom lectures, as well as um, uh, Q&A sessions, Facebook Live. Um, and we're actually planning a virtual seagrass festival soon, coming at the end of um, November, just to highlight the habitat of the dugong and its importance. I wish I could be there. And Teddy says hi to Sandra. Hi, Teddy. We always love our furry friends. Yeah. Ellen, thank you so much for your question. We're going to take a couple other questions from the audience. Thanks for joining hi. us. Uh, Luisa and Sandra, we've got a bunch of other questions. So we've got a question from Josanne Vereen, who wants to know, is a dugong similar to a manatee? Okay, so uh, how I always uh, explain things, um, dugongs and manatees, would be think about um, like a tiger and a lion. They're both big cats, uh, but they're different. So dugongs and manatees are uh, similar in that way. They, they are both sea, considered sea cows, they're marine mammals. Uh, but dugongs are found eastwards of East Africa, and manatees are found westwards of West Africa, all the way to the Amazon. There's only one species of dugong, but whereas there are a few species of manatees um, throughout their range from West Africa all the way to the Amazon. And even though they're marine mammals, dugongs and manatees are actually more closely related to elephants than they are related to whales and dolphins. And how do we know this? Know this? Some of the telltale signs is in their uh, anatomy. If you were to lift up a dugong's mouth and look under, you would see these tusks. So they have tusks that look just like elephant tusks. Uh, most of it is in males. In females, it rarely erupts out of the skull. And for manatees, manatees don't have tusks. So if you lift up the, the flaps of their mouth, you won't see any tusks, but they retain the toenails, just like elephants do, which dugongs do not have on their pectoral fins. So that's one of the main differences um, between dugongs and manatees. That is so interesting. I had no idea about elephants and the tusks. Yeah. Um, thank you for teaching us that. Um, a comment from Barbara Ballinger who says, wonderful presentation. Do the dolphin communities get habituated to your research vessel at all and curious about you? Shall I take that? Yep. Um, yeah, we do realize that the dolphin communities, um, specifically the species that I'm working with, the humpback dolphins, the pink dolphins, they are actually quite resilient and adaptive to research vessels. Um, other than research vessels, um, like some other human activities that doesn't pose too much threat, like um, noise pollution, they are actually quite adaptive in terms of visual behaviors. They don't really um, dive in and just swim away when there is a presence of human activities. Um, but lately, we have been starting to try study the acoustic part of the dolphins to see like how human activities actually affect them. But other than that, they don't seem to be very much affected by the presence of our research vessels. And usually during boat service, we'll give them like a duration of like 10 minutes to allow them to customize with the presence of our boat before we really approach them and start um, taking behavior um, uh, data. Yeah. That's it. Um Humpback dolphins seem to be less uh, disturbed 
when you know boats and people are around as opposed to the other species that we study which are Irrawaddy dolphins which we didn't actually feature much in our presentation so those are a bit more skittish they tend to flee um, when boats come around with that that guy over there yeah love it thank you <laughs> we've got a great question from your fellow conservationist Pablo Baborglu who wants to know, do you think that the pandemic has given you a chance to educate people about the need to protect nature? Or do you think they'll go back to business as usual when this is all over? I think that at the beginning when everything was really scary and we really did, didn't know, I mean, the whole world didn't know what we're dealing with, this coronavirus. We, we didn't know the impact, the effects on people. Everyone was in a panic mode when lockdowns first started. Everyone went into panic buying, etc. I think at that point, people were still very much um, sort of, you could mold, you could mold the, the thinking about what the impacts are of coronavirus on on these animals and on the environment. But at least here we see that things have sort of started going back to business as usual and people have you know, become a bit laxed. And um, I think that it will, it will take a lot of reminders and a lot more outreach programs to remind people and to share with them really what we're dealing with and why we all need to do better for the environment. Even, I mean, here we had three months of lockdown and it was great for the dolphins, I imagine. We went out there, but now that things are back to normal, I think that it's business as usual again. And it's almost like, it's almost like, summer break it's like, oh summer break's over we're back to back to work so i think for the dolphins too that you know their summer breaks over and everything's just back to normal with boats and trash um the trash problem isn't going away so we really need to do more and there are lots of people in malaysia here doing you know a lot of effort for marine debris mm. so speaking of marine debris there's been a lot of questions about trash um one person has asked, how much plastic do you see in a single day out on the ocean? Uh, Susana Luis de Amable wants to know how much single use plastic is there in the local communities? And have you been able to find any alternatives to replace them and how receptive have local people been about that? I think in our field site, let's talk about Langkawi, we have seen some days, especially when a storm, storm comes the night before, the next morning if you're out on the water, I mean, it's just all sorts of things, except the kitchen sink, because maybe that has sunk. But it's all sorts of things just floating where we've seen shoes and plastic bags and gunny sacks, soft toys, uh, you name it, we've seen it all. Um, so there is a lot. Um, and there's still a large culture of using single-use plastics you know, in general in the country. There are places where NGOs are working hard to get that reduced, you know, finding incentives for people to switch. But I think that we're quite a long way off um, from achieving, you know, being where we want to be. And definitely, uh, even at Marset, we would need a lot more resources to be able to implement more uh, long-term, middle to long-term programs that will tackle um, marine debris, um, marine debris, and single-use plastic usage within the communities. Uh, you know, here in Southeast Asia, there's a huge culture of night markets, wet markets in the morning, and people mostly go and they bag everything in single-use plastic bags. So that in itself is a huge challenge, and I think we will need to work really hard. Um, and hopefully, with everybody's support, we can have those resources to do more. Right, and that's such a wonderful way that we've seen here where people can mobilize on the grassroots level to have local and state legislation against single-use plastics. So I'm, I'm hopeful you all are able to do that um, in Malaysia as well. Um, we've got a, a bio question from Adrian Morrison who wants to know, do saltwater crocodiles eat the porpoises and dolphins where you work? Um, I've never, in all the years, I've never seen Saltwater crocodiles do that. Have you seen any, Sandra? They don't no. Yeah, but we have seen some dolphins with shark bite marks. So where we work in the coastal waters, we're aware that there are bull sharks. And um, so we don't know what species of shark bit those dolphins, but could have been bull sharks or any other shark. But definitely not the saltwater crocodiles. I think they don't come that far out away from the estuary to be able to have an impact on the dolphins. 
Thanks. All right, um, a couple of really fun questions here. Uh, how do the dolphins you work with look different from the ones we see in the TV and movies? And dolphins often look like they're smiling, but are they really? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you for those questions. Those are fun. Um, I'll take the first. I'll take the first one about how do they look, and then Sandra can take the next one. Uh, so. The, the dolphin that we most familiar with, you know, the first dolphin that you might ever seen in your life would be on TV. If you recall to the movie Flipper. So Flipper was a bottlenose dolphin. There are a couple of species of um, bottlenose dolphins in the world. Um, so we work with completely different species. We don't work directly with uh, bottlenose dolphins. So mainly it is the species that you saw in the presentation, the Indo-Pacific humpback dolphins that they have some pink um, coloration. So the only other species that we know turns really quite pink is the Amazon River dolphin, the Boto. Uh, so we have the Indo-Pacific humpback dolphins that turn pink. We have the Irrawaddy dolphins, which have a rounded head. So they don't even have a snout. They have rounded head, big petal-like flippers, um, and they're completely gray. Uh, and then, as I mentioned earlier, they're really cool because they can spit water uh, when they're hunting for prey. Uh, we also work with finless porpoises. You can see finless because they don't have a dorsal fin. Again, also a rounded head. So Irrawaddy dolphins look somewhat like this as well with a rounded head, but they have a dorsal fin. So those are the three most common species um, that we find in near shore waters that we work with. We do have bottlenose dolphins um, in slightly further offshore waters, but we do not see them often enough to be able to study them persist persistently. Well, thank you both so much for this. It's been so great to speak to you live and ask questions. Um, Sandra and Louisa will be in their booth um, to answer any additional questions. And there's also a link there to reach out to them and sign up for Marisette's mailing list and to support their work if you'd like to engage with Marisette some more. And I invite everyone now to join us back on the main stage for Dr. Jane Goodall's presentation. Thank you, Louisa and Sandra. Thank you, Jane. Thank you so thank much, everybody. everybody.